Up here is the topic here. Uh, if I can get the mouse to work, there we go. So, derelict vessels are our main issue. You guys look outside right now, you'll see the one on the right still sitting out there. Um, the one on the left is one of three that washed ashore in the last windstorm uh, a couple months ago. We had three of them wash ashore, we got rid we've destroyed that one, we've destroyed an the other two that wash ashore also. So, all three of them have disappeared. How do, you, uh, how do you destroy it? What's that process look like? So, uh, it depends. Uh, so, we have to seize them. If we do it locally uh, as a department, there's also the Department of Natural Resources, DNR, has a derelict vessel fund that we work with. And so, between working with the two of us, we seize the boat. So, I basically post a notice on it saying, you've got 30 days to remove this vessel. And there's strict rules about uh, what they have to do with it. Get it out of a certain area, get it out of the water show us some sort of sign that you're working on it. After 30 days, we can take custody of it. So then we take custody of it. And at that point, we put it out to contract with a local, like there's, there's multiple ways. We destroy the boats because it's the most effective because we don't want these boats back on the water. You can technically auction them back off, but all they're gonna do is end up back right in our waters. Which has been the problem. Right? Which has been the issue. And so we destroy them most of the time. So either like- That's, that's usually, pardon the interrupt. That, that's usually on site, like right there. Is that you, how you destroy them? No, we take them to, uh, like, we seize them. Like, this last boat I seized, we ended up on our decal pier for a little bit. I just took it to Yacht Fish. So Yacht Fish generally is the local okay. um, business that destroys boats within our area. We can put it out to anybody in the state, and they just bid on it. But with the cost of transport and everything else, it's just easier to keep it local with Yacht Fish. Okay. Um, the other option is to remove them and either destroy them ourselves or... Uh, go put them on airport property out there in the Bremerton area. The port has some property out there that they're letting boats go out there and either be destroyed or destroyed um, because of the cost of it. Well, was so, that boat, that wasn't one of the boats that's been set down? No, before. so that boat itself, we'll discuss later on some rules about some of the changes I want to make to stop this from happening, but what it was was a houseboat in the port of Bremerton. It was actually the boat that's been behind our police boat for the past 10 plus years. A guy lived on it named Garth. Um, lived on it for years, decided I'm going to move to shore, move to the house, sold it. A guy from Seattle bought it. Well, this boat doesn't have any engines or anything on it. It was just built to be lived in, not, it's a cement <clears throat> hold boat, it's a cup, made out of cement that you glue the rest of the stuff on. Pretty much is how they make those boats. And the owner of it couldn't get insurance on it, didn't have a motor for it, stored it on the breakwater of the marina for quite a while, and then built up such a huge bill at the marina on Saturday, or no, Thursday was the day I went out, Blackjack Creek, heck that, miserable. Um, got on it when the marina staff was gone, goes, I'm going to sail it and anchor it out in the inlet. Doesn't know boating. Takes it, goes, trying to sail it, crashes it into our sandbar because it's shallow up in that area, decides... Should I call the police? No. I'm just going to get on my dinghy and row to shore. It'll solve itself later on when the tide comes in. Tide goes out. It lays flat. It's a cement boat. Not light. Tide comes back in. Floods it. It's there. Still can't get a hold of the owner. He eventually called the Coast Guard and said, oh, I didn't know it sunk. He told the story about crashing it. Hasn't called us. Can't find him. So right now the boat's still there. <coughs> We're trying to figure out what to do That's with it. it. Um... Talking with the state, trying to figure out what's the best option for that boat itself. And then you got the other boat uh, out in the background. Yep, in the background you can see the 52 foot boat. Um, the the houseboat? Uncle, the houseboat out there, yeah, it's kind of. Uh, it's a power boat. It's a power boat right there. That's been out there since. The decal two years. When we did the decal pier, there was an unintended consequence. Which is every all these kind of transients thought, hey, this is a great way to get ashore. And it's great, great a problem. And yeah, we're yeah. So I'll get back to those boats here in a minute. So why is there the increase in vessels in the area? Recently, the state created rules and marinas requiring insurance. So basically, it used to be people could put boats in there, just pay their fee, and like we weren't checking tabs, we weren't checking insurance. It was just it was there. Well, because of risks of boats getting, you know, pollution or something like that, they started causing, you have to have insurance. Like 500, and then on larger boats, they actually have to be inspected and pulled out of the water and inspected. So all these people can't afford to do this. So they're getting kicked out of the marina slowly. And then they're just trying to find open water to put them. 
And that's like the boats that are further inlet in the inlet. There's three that are tied up. Well, now there's four tied up together. And now two of them are at our pier right now. It's just a, his name's Steve Hansen. He owns a yacht brokerage. Well, he buys a piece of crap boats, tries to sell them. He can't afford to insure them and get them inspected, so he just anchors them out in the water. DNR's been finding the hell out of him. I'm sorry, it's weird. Finding him. In my language, I do apologize. No, it's we, part of the yeah. job. Um, we like that. They're finding him. But he's just not dealing with it. I'm dealing with his sons. I'm dealing with all sorts of stuff. The red boat that's on the pier right now was the one that the guy was that was supposed to work on Steve's boat fell off and died a year ago yeah, and then ran aground. Um, so, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a headache dealing with these boats and dealing with the rules of the inlets. Um, but that's why a lot of these boats are showing up now is because of all these increased... They can't get in the marinas. Marinas are kicking them out, and they have nowhere else to go. When you say open water, do yeah. you mean that's not under the jurisdiction of the city or the county or Bremerton? Or so, I only got right. two of them because I dealt with the Navy. That's exactly I had to meet the Navy. Ones. So, okay. what it is is we have, um, I think that map's further down in there also, yeah. but not as big. Okay. Um, when it comes to waters, RCW basically states that a municipality um, has the water halfway through mm -hmm. to the next municipality. Mm -hmm for jurisdictional rules. So we, the city of Port Orchard has this area that's right here because that's halfway between us and Bremerton or halfway between us between and county. That doesn't mean we own the water. The water is either privately owned up to a certain point depending on the, you know, something about 500 feet, something about 100 feet, or it's state land, DNR, uh, natural resources. Right. But, yeah, typically you have upland ownership to ordinary high, then you have Tidelands. Tidelands can either be owned privately or they're not. When you buy the property, sometimes you have Tidelands. But the Tidelands will end at the Inner Harbor Line. And from the Inner Harbor Line to the Outer Harbor Line is the DNR manages the mud because it's water. It's mud of the state, basically. So DNR, depending on where you're at, you're either over somebody's private Tidelands or your over the DNR's managed Tidelands. Yeah, so they have their, the man, they're managed, but we're, we have jurisdiction over half of it. So it's not we don't own it, but we have jurisdiction over it. And then DNR, to be honest, like if the guys that deal with their like vessels, there's three people. Mm -hmm. One full-time guy who's the boss, and then the other guys are part-time. They work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. For the whole state. For the whole entire state of yeah. Washington. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like they have the resource. Like, we talk about being short-staffed and resources. We had, our, we had a meeting with the Navy just earlier this week or last week, you know, about derelict vessels and their concerns about our boats. Um, but, you know, we talk about staffing and can we get out there or what can we do because we're short-staffed. And But they have three people. And luckily, I have a pretty good relationship with one of the guys, and we've been able to do quite a bit and get rid of a lot of boats within our area or within the greater Kitsap County area because they realized we were having such a problem. So that is an advantage for us uh, at this point in time. Um, the cost to remove vessels, and this mainly has to do with, like, if they sink also. But, I mean, but the price can change drastically. There's quite a bit. Um... Right now, we've got a 52-foot boat out there that's been there for two years. So if you look at if that boat were to sink, it's 50, you know it could cost us up to fifty thousand plus to raise the boat, get it out, and then destroy it is what it could do. And so here's the deal: is so the state has DNR has a fund for derelict vessels. It's not a huge fund, and it's for the whole entire state of Washington. So Bainbridge Island had that huge boat sink. It was a year or two ago, I think, and it was like a hundred and some foot boat, and it wiped out their fund. So then there was no more money for municipalities and counties to ask for reimbursement for when we had to deal with these boats when they sank. And so if we were to deal with that, you know, so when we look at impounding these boats, you know, I talked to the owner of that 52 foot boat. I'm like, oh, I just, you know, it's not sinking yet. It's just sitting there. It's getting dilapidated. Like the photos, I, I have photos each time we go out. You can see it getting in worse and worse condition, but I'm like, 
Is it in DNR? It's in, it's in our jurisdiction of DNR's land, but it's not a high enough risk for DNR to right. uh, deal with. But on the other with. hand, there's the, the there's the piece that they have to move it so many miles. There is. Yeah, but the DNR's not going to enforce that. Though. They don't enforce it. I mean, they rely on the us. Ninety day stay. Yeah. So yeah. why can't yeah. we enforce? We talk about that. I have that later okay, on. I'm, I'm sorry, talking about that. Ahead. Yeah. Everybody's jumping ahead. Um, he's right. got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll talk about it. But um, but you know the cost of it, and the, and when we talk about this as it comes down is. It is the money that disappears, and that's what happened with us. Is the money disappeared from the state, and we were like, "Well, we're not going to do anything because it with these derelict boats because it's going to cost the city money, the and police department, the police department money." Sorry, and then um, we're not going to get refunded by it. So if, if DNR does have money and they do approve it, we get reimbursed ninety percent of the cost. So if something were to happen, like we're to deal with the sunken sailboat right now, we get reimbursed ninety percent of the cost as long as they have the money. Um, but if they don't have the money, we don't get reimbursed. So then we look at those kind of costs. If we have a ton of boats, like in like Salmon Bay and you know Seattle area, they got some major boats with you know. Yeah, there's a very good chance you don't. And so um, these are things to think about as I go on with the my I call it my three tier project yes. about this stuff. So the first tier is the Decal Pier. Okay, so like this boat here on the left, right there, that's the Claymore. That's one of Steve Hansen's. What's one of those three boats that? are anchored out uh, in the inlet most of the time. It keeps coming back and forth. Right now, I think it is on our pier at this moment because it's broken down again. The red boat's there. And the red boat's there with it, too, because I think they're both broken down. I yelled at the drunk That's not the public dock, though, right? This is, this, is our, this is our public dock. Our, this is looking from the end of it going back towards the city. Okay. The Cal Pier. So we have, like, our, our, our POMC right there, which now come back. This part is basically what we allow. The hours we allow... Um, when they're allowed to be there, commercial vessel type stuff. Good rules, it's the enforcement of it that's the problem, in a way. The penalty is it's a misdemeanor. So, if you park downtown for more than a lot of time, you get a parking ticket. And that's a lot, that's easy to justify. If you park more than six hours on our pier, you're getting arrested for a misdemeanor. Our courts aren't going to deal with it. They pretty much said it. It's hard for us to justify the time, the charge, an effort to do a misdemeanor for someone parking longer than it was supposed to be. When they're abusing it, yes, is great. But when they're only doing a few of it, you know, we got to look at how can we change these penalties. And so that isn't, comes. Isn't yeah. a misdemeanor? Isn't the standard a thousand dollars, not a hundred dollars? I thought a civil infraction is a hundred dollars usually. That's just how ours is written up. Okay. I don't know how our attorney created that. That's just what ours is written up as. Yeah, I think gross misdemeanor is five thousand, and usually a misdemeanor is a thousand. So it's just something we got to look at, but. Courts are already overloaded stuff. We can't book people right now. We can't charge stuff. you got to find them anyhow. Um, I mean, you know. Yeah. And so, I mean, so what I'm actually looking at doing is, uh, or the other issues with it, is dinghies taking up prime boating spots. So, you know, they go down to the end where it's better for, you know, larger vessels to get into and deeper than... Because it's the shortest distance. Shortest distance. And then... Not to their derelict boat um, out in the bay. We don't have, like, any sort of registration or way to track boats either. Um, when we come to that, so well, solutions. We're thinking, about, we're thinking about at least designating a ding tie-up area. Yeah, and so um, basically changing the penalties to a municipal code that's basically a ticket, like a parking ticket. Mm -hmm. I can walk down there and write a guy a parking ticket for parking longer than six hours, not a problem. I can go down there and write him a ticket for parking overnight, not a problem. It takes a few seconds. We have cameras now that can work soon. as evidence. It's soon, a, soon. Yeah. but the, the the DVR doesn't have. The capacity to do what we wanted it to well to meet the public records act so okay we have to make some modern right. well, we don't need video. well we don't need video we take pictures we'll, whatever we'll it is. have it though. but there's it's a lot simpler for us like gig harbor does this they've changed everything to basically parking tickets mm -hmm. because then the money comes back to the city and it's simpler for officers just to say here's your you know make a different these are just numbers i made up but make us way works at blake island when um, i go out there yeah it's just here's your ticket there we go. We can leave a criminal code if we want for those repeated offenders. Like you get five tickets, and you're continuing to do the same violation here. Now it's your municipal code. Whatever we want for that. But it would be a lot easier for me to go down there and say, "You parked your boat here overnight. Here's your ticket. Here's yeah. this. It takes two seconds of my time. This money comes back to the city. It's it's a lot easier to justify that, and it's not going to deter a lot of people. So um, if you're going to change the infraction portion of the code, which isn't a problem. Um, that will just be the council's chance to look at 
what we have with the from six to ten or six to eleven, mm -hmm. and you can't be more than so many consecutive days in yep. a week. So I think you would probably revisit that. I wouldn't change any of that. No, no, I'm saying that's all fine. That's why they're, they're, they're broken into bucks. different areas. You're there for more than six hours. It's a thirty dollar ticket or twenty five. You know I'm saying if the council wanted to change yeah, any got, of that, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's just you're gonna have to change the infraction board. Yeah, just change the infraction. Board. That's all I'm looking for is basically to make it non-criminal, make it an infraction, unless it's a repeat offender type deal. And two fifty is for like fishing. commercial. So like people go there to do commercial work, you know, or whatever. Oh, different see. things like, you know, it's just a bigger penalty to make so we don't have commercial businesses going there and doing stuff if we don't want to. Like I guess the guy selling crap. The numbers are just made. He's up. gonna make five hundred bucks, and it's you can do a whatever. Five dollar fine is nothing. He'll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Expense. So yeah. So I'm just saying, you can make whatever numbers you guys. Are it's just a quicker fit. way for us to have some kind of accountability for people that are continually violating. Yeah, because the courts already told me pretty much we're not dealing with this. You know, the municipal code for the most part. Um, so your code language would have either criminal or civil as an option to you, rather than specifying one or the other. Yeah, and the criminal portion of it could also just be like. It, it even have a criteria of you you do this so many times like you got five talking tickets in the past you know six months and it's now a criminal charge or something like, and that helps with our courts if we can show repeat offenses with the courts then they're going to be like okay maybe we can force this um, and go along there so I believe a, a municipal code for parking infractions would make this a lot more enforceable by us as officers to go down there and deal with this um, situation. Because like he was saying, it brings in a transient community down there on those boats, and they come in there every day to go to shore to go get their beer and then go back out. And so if I could sit there and say, you know, this is your third day in a row coming here, here's your ticket, then maybe that might stop them from coming in at least to that dock to go get their beer. It may cause problems for other marinas, but it may stop our dock. So, um... How much did you guys expend looking for that lady that everybody thought had drowned and she was at the Whiskey Gold? That was, well, even for us as officers, it cost quite a bit. I mean, we were on the water for hours, so you got how much the fuel for our boat is. You got our man hours we had to do because it was overtime, most likely. And then let alone the Coast Guard, I mean, like, they'll spend 10, 20, 30,000 just to come out there and look for a person for these, you know, drunk people that <coughs> come in there. I went there, when I went to go tow a boat in from the DeKalb Pier, I'm like, who left garbage next to this boat? And it turned out she had, the female that we looked for, this is early before that, had just passed out drunk on the pier next to that boat and was just sleeping with her beer can next to the, the um, boat as I was dealing with it, you know. And they're just, you know, if they fall in the water or have issues like that, I mean, it's a, a deal where we have to deal with. So um, we're going to talk about the advantages of doing that. Uh, other suggestions, creating a dinghy only area, which Mark mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe some sort of sign-in kiosk, you know, that'll come in for other reasons, but maybe some device that is basically like my WN number, my name, and my phone number. So that way if we so have... So something in our code will require any vessel there yeah. Yeah. to sign in, and then we've got the time. Accountability. Yeah. It's and it's accountability. Just, <laughs> and if they don't sign in, then you just, they automatically get a ticket. You know, or something like that. We can go down there and deal with that. Um, but it allows us to have resources to know a lot of these boats. We don't know who they are or where they're from. They, they, it's such a transient boating. They move from port to port to port. They have like six or seven on their list, and they just move from. And I got three out there right now. I'm like, I have no clue who you are. I okay, even had a pet pet squirrel. You know, it's like, hey, you've got a pet squirrel with twenty beer cans around you. Awesome. You know, it's so like who's the guy that's tied up to the pot fifty two foot power boat? I noticed there's a sailboat that's been tying up. Is it a blue one? No, it's just a white sailboat, but he's been, he's tied up, he's using the anchor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the there, anchor. there's a guy going around, there's a couple of them, the blue one was when I was tying up a lot, but in future endeavors, there's a lot of people that are ending up on these boats because they're cheap, but they know nothing about boating. And then they end up trying to anchor, and they can't anchor, and their boat drifts, or other issues. And that's why we see a lot of these rafted together boats, because one guy will go down and an anchor, set an anchor, set an anchor yes. and then the rest will tie to it. Or you got the guy that owns the fishing business, the charter business off of Bay Street, Randy. He actually will go out and set anchors for people so that uh, it's a better anchor, but he's towing all these boats out into our area to set these anchors. Why is he doing that? Because I have no clue why he does that. Well, he does it so that the boats don't break free. He feels okay. he's doing a favor by setting okay. better anchors, but he's also just bringing this community into our 
our boats here. So the message that the Navy has is they had a body wash up, they had a boat wash up, a couple of boats. Linwall called me and that's when I forwarded that thing. Mm-hmm. Where, where does, um, I mean, obviously alcohol sounds like it's a major factor here. Where does boating under the influence? Uh, it, 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 that part is catching them. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like, we don't have our boat out on the water, mm-hmm. you know, a lot. You know, we're down to minimum staffing a lot. Can't get out there. Most of the time we see them is actually on, either tied up to the pier or, um, you know, pretty much just tied up to the pier. So is it, is they, they can sit, you know, as long as they're not, with it. no, as long as they're tied up and secured, they're not considered underway. Hmm. And so we can't do them like for physical control. They could just that way you can go out and anchor and sit and drink Could on your boat. Could ban alcohol though at our dock. It'd be an infraction. You know, like we could write a ticket. But it's just like open container. But if they're on their boat, which is considered their house by the courts, we can't charge them for drinking on their I boat. I don't think alcohol is a big issue here. It, it's coming to get it. I mean, it's not the These end of the world. These people are derelicts, mm-hmm. just like their boats, and that's the big issue. And Port Orchard is a weak area as far as law enforcement goes, uh, what we're allowed to do because we don't have the ordinances to support us. And so that's why we have this problem. And I think that's the big issue. Yeah. So And they're savvy enough to pick up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why Andy just said, you know, they go the circuit and they know where they can go and where they can stay. And, and it's just like, you know, they know people are watching them, but there are some places they can go, like here, where we don't have the manpower to watch them. We just don't. Right, they all talk. You see, and these boats, you'll see them in Paulsville for a while, and you'll see them in, you know, down here, and they bounce back and forth, and a couple of pirate ships that, no, there's like two or so, three. And we've been so, trying. Andy, do you and the chief have what you want to do? I've got, um, yeah, we can, for the most part. the ability part, to work with Sharon? And I then do have. I think Mark's got some things that you, some ideas here, too. Uh, basically, I don't think this is really. Of the I've, mi- I've mimicked. Department at all. Um, yeah. Hit that point, Andy, where, give them which, what goals. we're trying to get yeah. using. So, um, basically, I've mimicked other departments. Uh, I've gone to Oak Harbor, or I've looked at Oak Harbor. I basically talked to DNR, how do we solve our issue? You know, because they're like, you guys have been a hot point right now. How do we solve our issues? So they sent me to departments that have uh, created codes that have helped with their issues. And so when I look at the Sinclair Inlet section, that's where we come on with our next area, is I basically copied codes from cities that we like that will make it where we have better enforcement and ability to do the problem is that we're going to have is at first it's going to take us a while to actually get out there and and get these boaters to realize it. I'm trying to get the whole entire county on board. We're talking to all you know, Bremerton, Polsbo, Kingston, Bainbridge, Kitsap County. Get everybody on board with these same rules, and they won't want to come to Kitsap County at all. It may take a little bit, but once the word gets out that Kitsap County is nailing them, like we're we're getting better at the Port Orchard. They're all not going to Purdy. They've realized Purdy's not being enforced. So a lot of our boats that I've been getting rid of have all switched to Purdy now. But if we can get all of Kitsap County to deal with this. So this map right here, just for our justification, so we have like the city's portion here. We've got Bremerton's, which goes all the way up in there. You've got counties, a little bit of Bremerton, and of course the Navy and their shipyard. Um, what I'm trying to do with when we get Bremerton and county and everybody is to define Sinclair Inlet, which is where I put this beautiful little line here. That's the foot ferry route from Annapolis Dock to the Seattle Ferry. That would be considered Sinclair Inlet. So if we get yeah. Bremerton and County on board, all these rules would basically be enforced throughout the whole entire inlet. So we're not, if, if just the city does it, all we're doing is pushing them over to the county or Polsbo or something like that. We want to get the whole entire county on board overall. But if we can start working on these rules um, and get everybody else on board with Where, it. How does Bremerton feel about this or the county? Have you talked to them? County. Every other department, I talked to at the chief's meeting, Bremerton was the only people that weren't there they have an ILA with us where basically they have no patrol boat. They're relying on ours, so they're not an important piece as far as the patrol part. But the Kitsap County, Gary Simpson, uh, Polsvo, Bainbridge Island, they're all on board. They want to see what we're putting forward, and they want to move forward at the same time so that they don't become the dumping ground that we apparently are. So right now what we have is vessels have basically 90 days to, to stay on DNR land. They have 30 days at a, allotment at a time 
then they have to move it out of five mile, move out of a five mile radius for one day, then they come back for more than 30 days again, move out, then come back. Um, we do have, there are penalties, but the city itself has not adopted any of the penalties. So if I were to issue, I'd have to go through the district courts um, to do that. So we as a city don't have any of the penalties adopted or wax that we need to have adopted to enforce voting rules. So that's one issue that we need to work on. And then, like I said, our ability is to seize, auction, or destroy a vessel um, if they choose to stay longer than that. But once again, we have the upfront cost and um, you know that. So problems we come across, no locally adopted RCWs, tracking the vessels. I've tried to figure out how to track these vessels, like, you know, because we got there 30 days. We have to see it for 30 days before it's a violation. So I've, I've created grids, like, let's go out there and try to mark these off. How do we, but it's tough. They move from spot to spot. We're not on the water every day. Um, it's, it's hard to track these boats for 30 days and then to get 90 days total and mark. So it's like, I'm kind of doing a little highlighter. Like I saw it today. Doesn't mean it's 30 days in a row, but we're basically going off the 90 days because I can't see if they've left for a day or not all the time. Some boats, yes, it's obvious. The Encore hasn't moved at all, but other boats, it's a little bit harder for us to justify that. And Reggie got Reggie, some sort of letter from I, the DNR. I talked to Reggie yesterday or the day before he came into the office. And I basically told him we're, we're giving him his letter again. He's got to get his boat uh, moved or gone because he's my next concern. So, though another boat showed up that's now my next concern, but he doesn't know that. Um, the transient vessel community. I mean, they, they, go, they go places together. They all talk. They all deal with stuff. Some of them are problems. We have another boat that's back now that I've arrested the guy for. They go on the, to the marinas at night to tie up the power and then try to leave early morning. They steal stuff from the marinas. They do different stuff. I mean, they're not our ideal public. Do we love boaters? Yes. Do we like these transient boaters? Not most of the time. They're the ones that just are here to cause issues. We have the Coast Guards out. We have the DVs. We have derelict vessel issues. Um, they're just a pain. Yeah, we had to guy tap into our lights for the on the pier. Yeah, they, they cause damage to our piers. They uh, Safety concerns. That, like I said, we had a meeting with the Navy last week. They had, they've held a big meeting where we had to discuss uh, what we had to do with them because they're concerned about our boats basically going into their areas and they're having to respond to them and what to do with them. They brought all their big wigs and we had to sit down and have this meeting with county and us and them and DNR and so they're seeing these boat issues and want us to figure out how to fix it. Um, and then environmental concerns, septic discharge, oil and fuel issues. You know, a boat sinks and it's got an engine on it, where's that stuff going? Luckily that sailboat didn't have any engines on it so there was no oil or anything coming out of it so that's the lucky part for us. Uh, so what we can do is adopt the RCWs and WACs that are needed to um, do that. Look at creating municipal code violations. Um, basically for the, the rules I'm going to talk about later on, basically we have to create muni code violations because the state doesn't see it. So the shortened time that I'm going to suggest, the state itself does not see that as any of their RCWs or WACs. So we ourselves would have to come up with an RC, uh, muni code for the violation. Um, for those issues. Uh, so they, what basically cities have done now is they've restricted on those jurisdictional, like I said, with the Sinclair Inlet line. Basically, it, anybody that's within that area, you've got 14 days. You can stay there for 14 days between the months of May 1st and October 1st. Because they chose those months because of storms mm -hmm. and king tides. Most of our police actions are where we're having to do water rescues or between October and there because that's where the wind picks up, that's where the king tides happen, and all they break loose. And so they've limited that to only 72 hours of anchorage time. So the entire St. Clair Inlet? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get. If we get everybody on board, the whole entire St. Clair Inlet would be 14 days total and 72 hours during those the winter months. Because 72 hours total, total during the winter months. Yeah, so that they yeah. cannot... Um, yeah, that includes those... Yeah. For residences that have their boats tied up out front. No, private property cannot be affected by this. Okay. So we cannot so touch. Wait a so if it says you can't moor at all during the winter months, vessels cannot moor longer than 72 hours, but you've already said you can't moor during these months. So okay. during the winter months, which is basically between October and, October and May, three. they can't do more than 72 hours. Okay, three days. So, so that way, total? Total. Part of time. Total. So we can look at that a little bit different. Like we can choose. So for the for the whole for the whole span, seventy two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the whole span of those months, seventy two hours. Wow. That's what Oak Harbor did. That's right? what Oak Harbor did. So and I why mean, did they track it. 
Huh? How do they track it? They have just like Bainbridge. They the actually, harbor master. They have harbor masters right here. He's so they actually have someone who's officially the one that watching every boat that goes. Yeah, that's deals job. with all. That's their job. I hear about. So we don't have that again. ability. So like I said, we're not. We can't strictly enforce it to the ability that other places can. But it still gives that advantage. As long as I see that boat for three days, I can say it's been here for seventy-two hours. Lot, even if it's three lot. days over a week. Do boats have GPS that you can detect? Nothing we can do with, no. We no. don't have that ability. If we put a GPS thing on there, <laughs> yeah. it'd, it'd be, be nice. nice. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, but, I mean, it's all by, by sight. So like I said, if we, if we adopt it but county doesn't or Bremerton doesn't, then they'll just move to those areas. Does it still help us out? Yes. Okay. But does so it, either way, we're going to do this, and we hope that the other, the other ones hope we, they do go do along it, with yeah. it. And the reality <clears> is, is we're not wanting to prohibit these transient... The transient, there's two different terms. You have, a, you have transient boaters that have actual boats that live in marinas and then they go out for the summer. Um, and at that point, they're transient and they fall under those DNR rules. And they go all, you know, I've done that, where you, you just go from area to area and you anchor the night and you go someplace else. Mm-hmm. By the time you get into the winter months, unless you're pretty hardcore, you're not doing that. You know, yeah. you're not wanting to deal with your dragging your hook and ending up on the shore mm-hmm. and all the weather. So I think I think this language is pretty pretty Yeah, good. it's worked. They haven't had any complaints up in Oak Harbor. You know. The Oak Harbor is also a little bit easier because it's it's a little point, so it's like once you cross these two points, you're within our jurisdiction. So that's why we gotta try to get the other cities uh on board also. So it's just like once you're crossed here, you know, that ferry line, you're now within the Sinclair Inlet. Yeah, so I think anywhere te- within I here. think technically Sinclair Inlet starts yeah, Rich Passage and Port Orchard Inlet up in front of Elihi. So when you hit Spring Beach on Bainbridge Island, yeah. that's actually where St. Yeah, and, and I was just trying to find points, like some yeah. noticeable markers. I mean, we could use Lighthouse Point and the tip of, you know, Manette or something. I mean, we can figure it out. problem out further. That's what I'm right? saying. Because yeah. it's in the ferry. Nobody area. wants to anchor out there. There's no docks to get them to shore to go with alcohol. Well, There's on no... our side, it's really shallow. Our yeah. 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 yeah, but transit is redoing that dock at Annapolis. But that's within the Sinclair Inlet rules. So, I mean, yes, they right. may go a little bit further out, and we could change that. Yeah, that's, but that's, that's where it starts. I think, I think you would move that black and white line. I would move it all the way out. And, that, and that, this is just a, a, a yeah. line. Like, we can do everything, you know. that little bay there out in front of the sewer plant is a little bit protected. Yeah. And I think... If we, yeah, well, I that think was the issue, too. Reggie was going, Randy Screws, or there was the other guy... Uh, yes, he was going yeah. back and forth between yeah. anchor in front of the treatment plant, which you could mess up the outfall, the hook that outfall with their anchor. So I would probably yeah. move. So we can move it out, but we just have to find yeah. defined yeah. points. Yeah. We can't just yeah. pick like a random yeah. spot that's yeah. like doesn't have any markers because we have to basically yeah. say this marker, physical marker. And this, I mean, we could throw buoys out there and say, pass these two I think buoys. Lighthouse points probably. The yeah, put lighthouse point and the red buoy on Burmer off of Burmerton. Once you pass these here or wherever, it's just. Right. I think you're there. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's ways to do it. This is just a estimate, you know, just putting something somewhere. So, um, the advantage of that, basically, it restricts the amount of time they're allowed to be here, um, allows quicker action on vessels, and um, during the storm months, it makes it where we don't have to go out in that bad weather. You know, I mean, that's, it, I've been on some really nasty stuff trying to deal with boats because it's going to crash into the ferry or crash into somewhere. I mean, the ones on the beach, I was like, they're be- you know, heading to the beach, I don't care. But when we get that south wind, they're going to the Navy, they're going into the ferry, then we actually have to go out there. They're going to crash into a marina, and we have to go out there, and it's, it's nasty and it's dangerous for us. Would it make sense for the city to enter in a contract with Vessel Assist and let them deal with the vessels, or...? <laughs> I mean, so that you're not having to. You can, and, yeah. I mean, we can but look. who pays the bill? Well, that's. Well, and that, we'll talk about that later on too. Please, that's in there. Um, yeah, because you're paying for it. Either you're paying for it. Right. The other thing that right now, Bainbridge has in the act right now. They actually are going through their lawyers right now. Is any boat that's out there more than 48 hours has to register with the city. So if, you know, even if you're just be there for those 14 days. If you're there for more than 48 hours, you have to register with this their harbor master. But for us to be the city saying. Here's my boat, here's my contact information, here's everything, here you go. It didn't cost them anything. Well, Bainbridge does charge for some stuff, but we wouldn't. But basically, it's just saying, here's all my stuff, so in case we have a question about that boat, we can contact them. That's the biggest <clears throat> issue is it took me forever to track down the owner of this boat that's sunk out there right now because it's not registered to him, he's not from this area, he's not, um, you know. But if we get it to where it says, yeah, you have to register with us, um, 
like that. But that's a consequence of Eagle Harbor had that tremendous yeah. that was tucked in our house out there that been there permanently and mm -hmm. took him years to get rid of it. What is derelict status? I mean, Get so, to the status. I think it has to do with that RCW. Being able to get underway within 30 minutes. I thought it was right. Uh, derelict vessel means the vessel's owner uh, is known to be located and exert control of a vessel, has been moored, anchored, or otherwise left in the water as a state of public property. Um, contrary to RCW, the law has been left on private property without authorization, has been left for a period of seven consecutive days, and is sunk or in danger, sinking is obstructed. Obstructing a waterway or endangering life or property. Wow. That is the RCW for derelict vessel. Now, an abandoned vessel is different. There's a different status for an abandoned vessel. That means a vessel has been left, moored, or anchored in the same area without express consent or contrary to the rules of the owner, manager, or leasee of the aquatic lands before or on which the vessel is located for either a period of more than 30 consecutive days or more than a total of 90 days in any 365 day period. And the vessel's owner is not known or cannot be located. Known and located is not willing to take control of the vessel for the purpose of this subsection. Um, basically, that's where it is. It's five mile radius. So there are different definitions between abandoned and derelict. Yes. Um, and there's a vessel, there's a term for vessel too that the DNR has. And again, it has to do with it. It's able to get underway within 30 minutes. It means a very uh, watercraft or mobile artificial contrabass powered or unpowered intended to be used for transportation, people, of goods on water for floating marine construction or repair. It does not exceed 250 feet in length. And it must, uh, includes any trailer or something like that. Just a few different ones. So, um, so when we have these more restrictive rules, the other part that comes along with it is what kind of boats are allowed to be brought into the inlet. So when it comes down to it, it comes to um, restricting, sorry, I don't want to get the unseaworthy craft is what it basically would be titled under our thing. Uh, it shall be unlawful for a master owner or any person without the permit from the harbor warden to tow or move into the Sinclair Inlet any vessel or obstruction which prior to their movement or tow has been used as a permanent place of abode and was not engaged in navigation under its own power within 30 days. That's that boat there. Yeah. It was used as a houseboat. It was never used to go anywhere. The they can't inlet. take it out in the Sinclair Inlet without our permission. So who are we going to designate as the harbor warden? Is it going to be the front desk of the police department, or is it going to be the clerk's office? So this, like, they be, for cities like Bainbridge Island doesn't have a harbor master. They did the chief of police. Okay, um, is their harbor master? Um, we, get, Oak, we get buy you a white hat. Oak Harbor does have a harbor master. Bain, Bainbridge Island does have a harbor master, so they define that person as that. But for cities that don't have them, they just uh, uh, title it with the chief of police. So any dignitary underneath him, so like they can check in with me, they can check in with whoever, it's just as long as they're so, notifying somebody. So if we have this 48-hour uh, requirement to yeah. register, then we would post it at the dock, and so, the marina that they've got a cup, the marina office, uh, or yeah, for our to register? dock, to register. No, they'd have to come to... Right, so we would put a notification on our yeah. dock that right. you have to come to the police department during the, these hours yeah. within 48 hours yeah. or you're subject to this or RCW. If we have that kiosk at the DeKalb mm -hmm. Pier already, they can just check in with there and we can just check those too. And so... Um, is it likely that someone at the Bremerton Marina would check in with their marina office and come to the police? If they're in a marina, they don't count... As being out in the, this is being anchored out in the open water. Right. Okay. So if like they're in the marina, I yeah. care less. They're okay. already they're already okay. dealt with there. That's yeah, it. Sounds they, like we're they, stepping on this. These, these no, are people that are just okay. anchoring out in the inlet or okay. using our dock and using our dock okay. and stuff like that. And so we can leave it where if we have a kiosk at the dock for the other reason, they can check in there and just you know at the, there's a note on that pier that you must check in here. Like here's all the rules and they can go up to it and. Log in there or put their little piece of paper or whatever. So use the room honest people are going to do it. The dishonest people. Are. Yeah, but then we'll have something in our code. And we'll have a code of violation. You're not on of the this. list. Um, here's your here's your citation. Sure. Right. Yeah. And so once again, we can do a little parking ticket or whatever it is, and that money comes back to the city. Um, and so it continues. Um, it appears or exists in an unseaworthy condition. Uses or needs support from another vessel or watercraft to remain afloat or otherwise appears to lack the capacity of safe movement through the waters of navigational waters, other than barges, vessels, or watercraft temporarily disabled. So like if, you're, 
engine just stalls out and you need to be towed back in, that's not a big issue. It's um, or um, one's being towed by the harbor warden. So if we're, we, the police, are towing a vehicle um, there, and then basically you have to create like a a, a form because it says anybody's seeking permit to move it. So this is where they actually want permission to bring a vessel into our waters that they want to anchor. They have to come down to us and actually ask permission. Yeah, here's the boat. Can we bring it in and anchor it here, or we need to bring it to yacht fish or something like that? Then we can uh, approve it or disapprove it type stuff. Um, so a little bit more work on our end because it can't. It's not capable of. Yeah, it can't just. So that way we don't get these just junk boats that are just being towed in there and anchored off because the people are tired of them. Well, that's what the Hanson's doing. You had the, that that yeah. boat was towed in by that sailboat. Yeah. So that's the deal. Is they're just towing these different boats around because they don't run. And so we can put a restriction to that kind of stuff. So that's where that comes in. And so once again, you end up where we don't have this kind of scenario where the boat crashes or goes into there. So, um, and then the other part is uh, you mentioned, which I mean, it's a good idea. Is the the vessel assist have them deal with the boat issues? Um, but once again, then it's who's taking custody of the boat afterwards, or what's going on there, or do we look at having some sort of I mean, when we have to go out and get these boats, a lot of times we're just tying to the dock, calling the owner, saying, come get your boat. You know, they left it derelict and didn't tie it up right, or we have to go respond. It costs us money this, as a city, as a department, but it doesn't cost that guy any money. And so where do we look at, do we have some sort of code that basically says, if we go out and deal with your boat, not if you break down. If you break down and you're drifting towards the ferry and you're a good boater and we have to go out and assist you and tow you back in, not a big deal. That's just part of life. But if you're leaving your boat abandoned out there, or you just tie it up there, you're just leaving it there, and it breaks free during a storm and we have to go rescue it, we then can seize it, chain it to wherever, and you have to come pay a $300 fee to basically, in that money, to basically recoup some of the costs that we had to put out as a department city to pay for whatever we have to deal with. But I can guarantee anybody that's on, on a yacht, I'd say 90% of anybody that has what would be considered a yacht has... The insurance, insurance vessel and assist. they have vessel assist. Yeah. Now, somebody that has a 19 foot ski boat and the boat motor conks out. Yeah. Yeah, they they would. But, uh, but yeah, for the most part, even the, as that is, when there is a person actually on the boat, you know, unless they're like in direct risk of like getting run over or something like that, we say call vessel assist. You have to pay the 500 bucks, but hey, do it. What this is more about is those people that anchor their boats out and either they don't know how to anchor their boat or they just don't pay attention to it. Like, we all hate. Hardy Cousins boats. I mean, we've all seen them. Those three boats that are on shore, they sink, they, you know, whatever. But that's on private property. Nothing we can really do. I'm trying everything I can to get these boats off this property. But nothing I can do about his boats. But the one thing about Harvey is he comes down, especially if there's a storm coming or anything, he's down there looking at his boats, watching them, checking out. The only reason one of them beached the last time is because another sailboat broke free, then hit his boat and broke his free boat, boat free, and they all beached. Um, so that's where that came across, but he, he at least pays attention to his boats, even though we hate looking at them. Um, but a lot of people just don't care. They anchor them and they just leave them and then they break free and we have to go deal with them. And so we can have something in there that basically says like, we have now custody of this boat and you have to basically impound fee, you know, charge, you know, it's basically like an impound fee for that boat. So, um, like I said, overall hope is to get all the County involved where basically all the inlets, anywhere people that want them would want them more have these restrictions. So, I mean, you know, we're not going to be able to put an, a thing here, we're right in this little chute here, but no one wants to be in that ferry lane. They want to be up here, they want to be in all these little nooks and crannies that they're not having to deal with weather. So if we can get everybody on board, then um, we can go. Is he going to be gone? For, this part probably restricts more to him than anything, but we'll see. Water beautification fund is the third prong of this whole process here. Like that, nice boat. That's a pirate boat. That's the pirate ship. It is. It's a pirate ship. He used to have it in nice condition. Now he doesn't. He's, he's the guy that actually. He's hiding in Bainbridge right now. Yeah, he's the guy that actually said, "I'm a pirate." He was like proud yeah. of it. Yeah, there's a few pirates um, out there. There's another guy right now that has his. He wears his little three point pirate hat and has his flag, and that's what he does. But he was just in our water the other day. But supposedly, he Bainbridge says he's a nice guy and follows the rules, so we're not really concerned about him too much. But mm. this guy here has not been following the rules lately, so he's hiding from me. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, our, our waters are nice. It's, they're beautiful. We want to bring people to our waters. We want people to come to our docks and have fun. We don't want to have to deal with the drunk guys sitting on there. We don't want to deal with all these derelict vessels where they can't anchor up. And or at risk of having something issues like I, I want people. I want people here for thirty days if they're nice boaters, 
you know, and wanting to spend money here and do stuff besides the bars. So, well, one of the bigger problems though is still we have a uh, TMDL total maximum daily load that the city's responsible for for Sinclair Inlet, and that's a fecal count based. And so, if you have a boat like that, at least they've got a marine head. Now he's probably got the valve turned, so he's just going overboard. But a lot of these smaller boats, most of the ones that are at the beginning of Andy's presentation, and both that Reggie's on, there's there's nothing on that. So if they need to use the ba bathroom middle of the night, they're just squatting over the side of the boat. Yeah. I mean, there's no facilities, so um, that's definitely a problem. So what is what is this fun? It's basically like the city right now has the derelict house fun that code enforcement or. Uh, Basically, falls on code enforcement, you know, when we have house issues. But this fund basically used to deal with abandoned derelict vessels, supplement costs for recovering sunken vessels, um, supplement costs for enforcing vessel regulations. I mean, there's costs for everything that we have to do to deal with these boats and assist the waterfront issues or other projects. So it's not just restricted just to boats. I mean, this could be something that is used to help get rid of the other boats on Harvey's property, you know, or whatever it is we decide to do with it. But it's to make the waterfront appealing and work on the water. Um, deal uh it could go back under the code enforcement just like it is right now but then we would be working with it obviously because law enforcement deals with a lot of the boat issues also so it'd be me and uh doug. doug basically or us and doug working together to figure out exactly what boats we want to deal with how we want to deal with it what it does yeah it have to be people that can write tickets it would be yeah um you know ideas of how it could be funded so originally Obviously, to start up something, the city would have to put an original investment into it. So we look at the boats that we have out there. So the original investment depends. I mean, we have 50-foot boats out there. So do we say, what would a 50-foot boat cost to deal with as original investment? Do we say, typically, we have a 30-foot, 40-foot boat out there? You know, whatever original investment would be to deal with it. The difference between our house fund, I think, I don't know how our house fund gets money put back into it. The difference is... is <laughs> we can allocate those parking fractions and different things we deal with basically to go into those funds. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Port of Bremerton right now, so Kathy is working with me a lot on this stuff. The problem is, so Port takes a boat, the person's not paying their mortgage. It's generally a, a derelict boat. They then put it up for auction. Some guy comes and says, I'll pay a buck for it. That guy pays a buck for this boat and then takes it and anchors out in our water. Mm -hmm. That was a problem for us. So I had, we had a chat with Kathy. Kathy has stopped doing that. Unless the boat is actually worthwhile, they're actually removing them from the water and destroying them themselves. So what they created was a tax on their slips. They pay a five dollar fee each month to that goes to this fund that they now use to destroy boats. So can we look at doing the same thing with marinas? We have four hundred and something marina slips uh, within the city of Port Orchard. So do we say a buck a month a slip? You know that provides almost five hundred dollars a month to supplement this account so it grows if we have to use it then there's something to keep it going instead of using it all in one house and then all of a sudden we have no money anymore it's just kind of like a one-time investment but then we have different ways to kind of put money back into this fund um i know on the houses there's now a cost recovery process you know you're not yeah. guaranteed to get anything back but there's well, a process to where that property owner. We have the same thing. Like I have to ask, if I take your boat and, just, and seize it and destroy it, I have to send you a bill saying, here's your bill, pay it. Yeah. And then if you don't pay it, then I can send it to the state and say, hey, will you give me your 90%? And the state goes, I have the money or I don't have the money. And we go from there. The problem was, is we got to the point where the state had no money. And then we were like, well, we don't want to incur the cost. So we were just leaving these boats out there. And then within this past six months, we've had within this greater area six boats sink and then we've had four boats beach um because we have 16 boats out there at one point in time or more even maybe more than that so when we ignore the problem because there's no money we get a bigger problem and just to impound a boat and tow it somewhere would be a few thousand dollars instead of raising a boat which we're looking at that fifty thousand dollars you know this is just from a budgetary standpoint so you got it yeah, this is trying to program I can't some go, money and budget. Back. So this was the deal with this. You missed, this is my third problem with the water beautification part. So it talks about it's basically a fund by the city that allows us to deal with these issues. And originally the city had to put an investment in, but then we can supplement it with the parking infractions, the 
municipal code violations for being the boats being out there, and then a uh, guy saying the Port of Bremerton has a tax on their boats or their slips that they charge five bucks a slip, and they use that money to get rid of boats now instead of auctioning them off for a dollar. They've been towing; they're using safe boats to tow them out to the port property out uh, in the airport, and then they either leave them there or destroy them out there instead of having those boats go out into our waters and have issues. So the port's working with us. But no, Noah's not going to want to create another fund to track and, and a dedicated fund. What, what, what we're going to need to do is just fund, you know, have, have dollar resources in the budget to, to, to manage this. And, and I would think that would be part of, you know, the next budget process. We, we should, you know... Whether you increase the abatement fund. It's similar, to, yeah. Because I said this is similar to basically the, I mean, it's, it's just like the house issues, you know, they're derelict houses. Right, and, we, and, we're, and we've got, a, yeah, you're right. I, so, I hear what you're saying, and, yeah. and, we, and we fund that in the budget process, yeah. and we've got to create some fund authority within the police department for you guys to be able to deal with us. And so, so why do we need it? We need costs. I mean, it's expensive. It's expensive to deal with this stuff. DNR is not going to always be there to refund us. And if we let the boats sit out there, then we deal with more issues. And then we have our maintenance, you know, just, there's just maintenance on everything from our boats, the gear to uh, the docks, anything to keep things looking nice. And then any future problems. You know, you might find right now we're dealing with the, the influx of boats coming out here because of the insurance reasons and the, but give it a few years and who knows what the next issue is going to be that's going to cause boats to end up out in our area. You know, houses are too expensive so now everybody's just buying these cheap boats. And once again, we end up with more, you know, there's going to be different problems that we may have to work we, with. We've got to get out in front of this. To have fun. And so, um, I missed the end of it. So, excellent work. I mean, we're trying to get the codes, we're trying to look at different cities, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, so how far along are you in the code? So, I'm, I'm pretty good on the code for the Sinclair Inlet. Um, are you ready for Sharon to take a peek at it, Chief? Yeah, we're right there. We're, we're okay. close to that. The dock one won't take much. Uh, it's just basically we had to figure out what penalty, like cost-wise penalty, you have to decide. And then... Um, you uh, and I want to talk to Sharon tomorrow when she's in the office about hand, handing this off and then maybe take it to a work-study session. Not next week, I don't think, but next month, which would be... June, June's work study. If we can have a red line version, you. So I mean, is, that, is everybody? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I yeah. think it's a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, the most important thing here is paying attention to this locally through our department because, you know, just like the meeting we had with the Navy, they wanted to know about our response and. If the sheriff's office would respond, if a boat's heading toward one of the carriers, and you know everything was about response, and I said that's not the answer here. The answer is to prevent the boats from being there in the first place. I said we can really reduce this if we can get some local authority and some teeth, where we can go out there and actually do something and get names and information which these people hate. They don't want you to know whose boat that is. And we get them registering, or we hang in tickets on them for these infractions. We're not waiting 60 days under DNR rules before we can really do anything. Um, after posting in the newspaper and everything else that we have to do, I said it just returns a little bit of authority to the local police department so that they know, and it becomes knowledgeable in, in their circles, that Port Orchard isn't the place to go to be safe. Yeah, and I will clarify with even if we adopt these new rules, like the shorter amount of time that they're allowed to be here to get the DNR funding to actually like destroy the boats, it still has to meet their RCW. So there still is that 90, 30 day plus another 30 days plus whatever. But if we can get out there on 14 days and start ticking them and harassing them, it may get them to move. And we can even put it in our own code that after 14 days, we're going to take custody of it. And you have to get it out. But then we can wait that 30 days and then start the process. Like So there, there's still ways to deal with it. It's just because just we say 14 days or 72 hours doesn't mean that the state's going to refund us. Tacoma's having that issue. Tacoma is fired as their water people. 
And they're like, oh yeah, it was here more than 14 days. We took custody of it. Now we want to get and we destroy it. We want the funding. And they're like, no, you have to to get our funding. You have to follow our rules. Um, but like I said, if we can get if we are more enforcement and getting that information, that would get them to not want to be here in the first place. So then we shouldn't have this issue hopefully overall. So it will take codes. It will take tickets, municipalities, costs. But hopefully it'll deter people overall um, between enforcing the pier and enforcing the waters. All right. Any other questions? Thank no? you. Thank, Thank you for you. your time, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Wait, I'll move my truck. Uh, <laughs> you can park in my spot. Um, do you want to jump to, we need to prioritize sure. the balance of the evolved. issues. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I have any. Okay. So prioritizing, what do you want to go to code? So yeah, let's go to the public, the okay. zoning code update and the public participation plan. And did Sean have to leave? No, he's going to move in his car. Oh. <laughs> All right. But is it a one hour, two hour? Two hour. Do you want to just give him a minute to he come might back? Be in the, he might be in the one hour spot. Is that right out front? Yeah. I should go move my car. <laughs> We're going to take a five minute break. Yeah. One of you can take my spot in the gravel lot. So, um, as you probably saw in your packet for tomorrow night, we brought forward a public participation program uh, for council adoption. And uh, this is for the zoning code update that we have uh, begun and we're going to be taking through the Planning Commission over the next couple of months. The, um, uh, this is a big enough uh, item and I think has enough of an impact on the community. We wanted to formally adopt a plan rather than just kind of doing our standard newspaper notice and um, our, our standard outreach. So this is similar to what we did for our comprehensive plan. Um, I think the the main points of this document are just to kind of outline what sections of code are being updated, repealed, replaced, and what kind of the, the code is going to look like uh, under the, the proposed framework that, that we've developed. And then also to really look at how, um, how we're going to do outreach and who, who is going to get what sorts of notice. Um, I think the, the most important thing that I want to discuss and one of the concerns that the Planning Commission had was with whether we're going to send direct mailings to everybody in the city. And with as many parcels as we have, I mean, you know, that cost would be in excess of $7,000 um, to, to send a, a mailer to everyone. We Every could parcel order 7000 Are we sending a letter or a postcard? Uh, well, I guess it, we, we could do a postcard, but then we have to actually print postcards, which is a cost in and of itself compared to just because we don't have that uh, ability in-house. 7,000 seems high because you can reach like two, 3,000 We're talking about all property owners, not all houses. Okay. So, so, so it's like 3,000 perhaps different parcel owners or how many are we talking about? No, I mean, I think there's more like 4,000, 5,000. No, there, there's, I mean, if you look at our persons per household, we're 14,000 people, so that's you know, probably uh, two, and a half per yeah. two and a half per household plus a ton of vacant parcels throughout the city. Well, it's like if it's all the commercial. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, another way of looking is if you think of the total households you're trying to reach, there's like what three thousand. I, I don't think we need to mail every, so, every parcel owner in the city. No. So, so what I wanted to town area or the certain parts of what I wanted to walk area. you through was the table that's on page six and seven talks about what zones are currently and what they're becoming. And so R4.5 is going to be renamed as R1. And then Terry has put together this attached spreadsheet that is a matrix that shows what the differences are between the existing and the proposed zone. And so our proposal is that unless somebody is jumping vertically in this table, they would not get a direct mailing notice. We would just do our standard notification procedure. We'll do outreach through Facebook. We'll do surveys. Um, it's only if somebody is actually being redesignated as we, you know, and I, I think where that's going to come into play is we're proposing to take commercial and we're going to, commercial could become commercial corridor or it could become commercial heavy. Right now our commercial zone allows things that are in the heavy zone like self-storage, gas stations, the commercial corridor wouldn't have uh, quite as many uses and so it's possible that people who are going from commercial to commercial corridor are actually having some reduction in what they're allowed to do. So that's somebody we would want to notify that you know there there is a change proposed. But if you're if you're just being renamed and mostly you're you know the uses if you're single family residents you're not really affected by changing from R4.5 to R1 because you're still allowing single family houses you're still having a minimum lot size and the same setbacks. Okay, so it's only if they 
lose potential yeah. development. And so really, it's, it's, okay. that's and if it's something's changed. changed mainly on mainly the map. commercial, it sounds like. It's going to be more in the commercial realm than in the residential realm. So I think, you know, one of my concerns with this whole exercise is I don't want to frighten people. I think people hear that something is changing and they're... Um, they may be jumped to conclusions when, in actuality, their property and what they can do on their property isn't changing uh, at all other than some really minor standards, um, which typically when we do changes to zoning code that are not site-specific, we don't send out those types of notices. So that would be consistent with our, our past approaches. So, um, um, so yeah, our recommendation is that, that we adopt the public outreach process as written uh, here, which would not include mailers unless somebody is, is shifting within this table from instead of going across the table. Um, right now, this public participation program has um, a schedule associated with it, which we're going to bring forward the zoning code, which is mostly drafted. I think Carrie and I are kind of putting the finishing touches on the first piece that's going to Planning Commission. Um, we're going to bring it in three sections to the Planning Commission for their uh, Initial review followed by the next meeting, they'll actually have a public hearing on that set of regs. And then we'll have one public hearing at the very end of this process on the entire code where people can come give testimony on the final code as, as it's been revised, as it's worked its way through the Planning Commission. So we're looking at about a four-month process with this potentially coming to council in the fall for uh, review in a work study meeting and then followed by uh, uh, proposed adoption. However, obviously that's the budget time, and so depending on availability of meeting dates, this could get pushed back a little bit while we're trying to get our biennial budget adopted. Um, but you know, ideally we would we would like to have this done in October or November. But um, you know, I think uh, finance has priority that time of year. You know, since we can put an insert for chimes and lights in the utility bills, is there something similar where you can just mention this is going on? Yeah, we, utility bills? we certainly can. Yeah. The problem is, I is mean, that what's the cost for that? It's not 7000 No, no. Um, I think we have a limited number of characters, so it's got to be okay. very short. But the, the challenge there is that you're only notifying... Uh, properties so like, that have yeah. improvements on them. If it's vacant property, they're not we finding out We reach that far way. more people with our website and our Facebook press releases. But I did check on that last week. Yeah. And um, Melissa through Noah said that would be possible, but what I had proposed, it was basically saying, this is happening. For more information, yes. go to yeah. our website. Yeah, just yeah. Mention but we could do yeah. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can certainly do that. And um, if you'd like, you know, if it's this committee's recommendation, we will add that as a method and tool to the list, and we'll bring a revised version of this tomorrow night. Um, I think the other question on the public participation plan is whether you want to actually discuss this in work study versus being able to uh, move forward with adoption. Um, I don't remember how full the work study meeting is. Um, you're, you're talking about the public participation plan again? And was, yeah, just for whether you want to work study? Well, it's never been to work study. Sorry, that's what I mean. The, Take the, it to work study. Not, not the code, just the, right. the public participation right. plan. Right. This is, right. yeah. I, I don't think we need to do that. I don't think so either. No, I mean, if that's why we put it on the agenda, but we, right. yeah. Yeah, we kind of felt like if we needed to pull it and push it back two weeks, we could. But I don't think the this council is, could choose to do that tomorrow night. Sure, right. that's that's an option right. for yeah. the council. So we will make one revision to talk about providing uh, a notification of this in the utility billing account. The other thing, I, I did want to walk through kind of some of these zones in the table that Carrie has put together, and this is really a draft matrix, but we're trying to, to format the changes into something that's easy for somebody to compare, kind of the before and after, and what are really the substantial changes that are occurring. Um, the one thing that we did not do in our proposed zoning code is we had initially left business professional out of the future code because we didn't feel that... Um, that there is a need for it. And of course, when we looked at the Tremont zone, one of the interesting things was that Tremont's vision called for developing mixed use development along Tremont, but the zoning regulations didn't actually allow mixed use development. And so our initial proposal was to go with a residential mixed use zone to replace business professional. But now that I'm considering it, the residential mixed use zone, as we've written it, doesn't actually allow things like hospitals. And so maybe we do need a, a business professional zone moving forward, and I think um, that could be the other addition to the public participation plan is to say in that table of zoning changes, we would have a go from business professional one and two to a business professional mixed use zone, which would allow residential and certain commercial uses consistent with our existing zoning 
And so I think I think that's one late addition that I'm going to to propose we make to this um, this proposed update. Have you okay. pushed this out at all to the, the realtors and the home builders yet? I gave a presentation at the home builders on Thursday, mm -hmm. um, and they were receptive to it. They did say that they would like to have uh, a meeting with engineers to look at some example sites and actually look at going through a development exercise where they plan out the improvements for a site under the new zoning and see what, if anything, comes up that is concerning to them. Okay. And so um, I think it was, it, they were, uh, they had some hesitations, but were generally supportive. It's, ch it's change. Yeah, it's change. change. And that means that they're going to have to review and comment on something. And they were a little concerned at the pace with which we were trying to do this. And I said, you know, one of the things that we're up against is this opportunity zone thing is potentially going to hit us pretty hard in a in relatively short order, and we want to be prepared for it. And um, so there, there was some discussion about how fast this was moving, but and also one person suggested, could we adopt this as an alternative regulation versus a replacement so that both codes would stay and you know, <laughs> stay alive? And I said, you know, that's not really our preference. They have four months. Isn't that enough time? Well, it's, probably, it's more like six months by the time we actually yeah, adopt it. How much it. time do they need? Yeah. So anyway, we'll, um, the, the new director, or the, I forget his title, Russ, it, yeah. the K, or uh, KITAP Home Builders has been a whole lot better to work with uh, mm -hmm. uh, since I, you know, I've been working with them for a few months now, and um, we seem to be on the same page with, on these things, and I will do everything I can to, to reach out to them. And Michael Iason's retiring. I don't know who this is. I heard he is. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, the end of the year. I'm not, I don't know, they haven't, they haven't named a replacement yet. Huh. So with that said, um, I just wanted to walk you through this table. Um, the, the zoning updates, um, starting in the residential zones on page one, we're keeping a green belt zone. It's going to be almost identical to the existing green belt zone, although one of the things that I noticed was weird is we have a two acre minimum lot size in the green belt, yet we allow five foot side yard setbacks, which seemed weird to me that you would bring, <laughs> bring whatever you're building right to the edge. Although I suppose for sites that slope off into Blackjack Creek, there may only be a limited buildable area on the uphill side. So maybe, maybe we do want to keep existing setbacks. Um, other than that, the uses are generally staying the same. Maybe it's side yard, five foot for accessory. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll continue to tinker with that. Then the residential zones, we're going to have six of them, R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. uh, R1 is low-density residential where only houses, backyard cottages, and accessory buildings are allowed. You can't do any duplexes or attached housing. So that's equivalent to our R4.5. Um, one of the changes there is that currently we have a lot of things like museums and churches and assisted living facilities that are allowed as a conditional use. What we're proposing under the new code is that, that those are all actually going to be permitted in a civic uh, zone, a civic institutional zone. And the neat thing about the civic institutional zone is it can be applied under any comprehensive plan map designation. So anybody who wants to build one of those things can apply for a quasi-judicial rezone, and that can be considered and it will be consistent with the comprehensive plan because they can be built anywhere in the city. So churches, assisted living facilities, um, a handful of, of uses that were conditional uses in a residential zone are now require a rezone, which council actually has more discretion on whether to approve or not approve them, whereas a conditional use, if you meet the criteria, we, are, we have to approve them. And so this is giving a little bit more discretion, and of course it goes to the hearing examiner with a recommendation to council for approval. So um, existing those, those facilities... Those are tough, though, because mm -hmm. typically when the hearing examiner has approved it, we need to some... That's where we've gotten ourselves in trouble in the past is mm -hmm. uh, when showing that the hearing examiner well, erred. Yeah, because you have to need a basis, not because you don't like it right. or don't like the location. Well, if you remember the language in our code on um, uh, where's rezones, carry help. Um, site specific. There it is. So what it says. Um, Application review, where's the criteria? Criteria for review. Um, generally, um, there is no presumption of validity favoring the action of rezoning. The proponents have the burden of proof to demonstrate that, that the conditions have changed since the initial zoning. The zoning must bear a substantial relationship to the public. Oh, 
something. I think it's the there is no presumption of validity favoring the action of rezone. Means I mean. Yeah, but let's say they've gone through all this whole process. Mm -hmm. The hearing examiner says, "Yeah, this is swell. Go ahead and do it." What's the council's role? Role. We don't have a role. What's the basis? I mean, it's very we, the birthing centers is the example I keep coming to. Fred and I were on the council at that time, and um, we hearing. I think we had it. Maybe it was right when we went to hearing the examiner. Our code allowed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nobody liked it. The neighbors didn't like it. It was in a residential setting. And we had no basis to review it. But that's, that's not an allowed use in the civic zone. The, the okay. list of uses. So, so let's, let's use it. Okay, so they want to do, somebody wants to do, build a church. Church. Mm -hmm. uh, next, in, in, in the middle of McCormick Woods. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they go through the whole process. The hearing examiner says, yeah, that's fine. You've, you've now mitigated we've, all the conditions. You, yeah, and now we've got a hundred people in the council chambers <laughs> saying, not in my neighborhood. There's no way in hell I want this. And, and, and the council says, well, yeah, hearing examiner, what were you thinking? But they've met the criteria. And, and that's where we got ourselves. All of a sudden, the city got sued and all of the council members were named uh, individually uh, in a lawsuit. Well, I, I guess... If you've got two hundred people two weeks testifying, later we that decision. if you've got two hundred people testifying that there are impacts of a facility, they it seems to me that they should have came the, to the hearing examiners. Well, yeah, and, and they ultimately <clears throat> that was the open record hearing. So it's not that the council's even holding a hearing; they're just. So why does the council have a step in this then? If it, the hearing examiner is making a recommendation, right, to council only on rezones because rezones are officially a legislative action. Okay, right. So, but the hearing examiner is reviewing this and is, you know, has the criteria, has to sort out all the comments. The, the city council can't hold a second open record hearing. They right. can only hold a closed record hearing, which would allow the people to testify who have already given testimony. And that's only if they chose to have a, a closed record hearing. They don't okay. have to have any hearing at all. I'm just trying to prevent a scenario mm -hmm. where we're, yeah. this, and not that I don't want this to go to the council. I just want to make sure we're not setting ourselves up to fail. Well, and I, I think... You know, you don't have, it's, it's pretty infrequent that you have something like a uh, assisted living facility or a new church that comes in. I mean, I, I've seen those things happen maybe four times in my career, and only two times did the project actually go forward and get, get constructed. Um, most of the churches that are out there, we're, we would give them a civic zoning that would allow to, them to continue to operate in that capacity. And so, and they'd be zoned outright. Versus, they'd be zoned outright versus, versus a conditional, conditional use, use, where if they want to expand, they have to right. come in and get a conditional use permit. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm just anyway. But that's to be that's a big, big difference between the residential zones is all those civic uses or all those other types of uses that are currently conditional use permit issues are now they have their own zone and the property needs to be zoned for them. And obviously, the school has a capital facility plan and they've identified where they want future facilities and what they own and so we zone those properties for the use that's intended there. And um, rather than saying that schools can take up area within our single family zone where we have done a buildable lands inventory and we're expecting that land to support residential growth. So that's that's a little bit of a change. Um, I think that our policy has become more familiar because when Rob was talking about the birthing center, people at that time didn't realize they had to go to the hearing examiner for their neighborhood input. They were waiting until it went to the council. <laughs> yeah, that there was, was our, a that lot of practice. Yeah, so, there was a yeah. lot of um, well, and and when a rezone comes forward, you're not talking about a birthing center. You're talking about a change from residential to civic, and that's the only thing that's being discussed. And any of the civic uses can be allowed. So you're not. You're not talking about yeah, it at the project use, level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're giving your testimony with the understanding that a range of things can happen. Yeah, it could be a school. It, could it be, was yeah. a very interesting uh, thing. So. Yeah. yeah. I can see that happening. If someone wanted to build an assisted living facility at some point. It's going to be expensive. Yeah, but they... But, but you'd, need, you'd need a lot, a lot of land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the west. Mm -hmm. That's the other yeah. thing is McCormick... Um, yeah. So there's our, our 1 through 5 or our standard zones. R6 is going to be a zone tailored specifically to McCormick Woods. And so that will apply to the existing areas of McCormick. And we'll get input from, from uh, McCormick communities and the HOA on that. 
it what it resembles our existing McCormick uh, R8 MWD zone or whether it, it looks slightly different than that. So the, um, the R2 mimics our R8. That's our biggest zone in the city by area. I think the big difference here is that right now we allow single family attached in R8, but we don't define what that looks like. And so um, we've always kind of assumed that it means you could have vertically separated townhomes where you would have attached units, but you couldn't do apartments in an R8 zone. And now that we are defining that R8 allows detached houses, backyard cottages, cottage courts, duplexes, attached houses, and townhouses, which are all defined building types, you know that you can't do a fourplex and you can't do an apartment building, but you can do these other these other building types. And so that's a whole lot more clear. And then the, the big difference is that there's a minimum lot size associated with each of those buildings. And so in order to build a duplex, you need a 5,000 square foot lot versus our current code would actually say you need a 10,000 square foot lot because it, we're, we're looking at eight units per acre, not how much land area is actually needed for that building type. And usually when you you don't have the setbacks between the two units. The lot overall gets smaller. Usually you have a shared driveway or a uh, shared parking arrangement. And so I think this will make it easier to build a duplex, and it'll make it'll result in duplexes that actually have enough land for the use but don't have a surplus of land, which is actually discouraging anybody from building a duplex because uh, you know they'd rather build two detached houses if it's the same density for both of those. Mm -hmm. Likewise, at the... Um, the townhomes go down to uh, 1,500 square feet because you're typically looking at, uh, you know, a townhouse unit is like 50 to 80 feet deep and usually 20 to 40 feet wide on average, and that's... Um, and they're vertical. And, and other than the end units, those middle units don't have side yards. And so you wouldn't... Right now, if you had eight units per acre, you end up with a 300-foot deep yard for a 20-foot wide townhome to meet the minimum lot size, which means that nobody builds townhomes. Yeah. Um, then the R3, 4, and 5, the 3, 4, and 5 actually correspond to the number of floors that are allowed. Uh, R3 allows for single fam everything from single family detached up to apartments up to three story. And so that's like our R12 zone is now. But again, there's no density requirement. For an apartment building, you need a 10,000 square foot lot and you can put as many units on there as you can park and fit within that height limit. Um, Townhouses are allowed at the same uh, lot size as, as the R2 zone. Um, and then fourplexes and a few other types are also allowed. And then the R, R4 and R5 would allow four-story buildings and five-story buildings respectively, but we're not planning on actually applying those now. That would come out of future sub-area planning if we want to provide additional height incentives uh, in, those, in those areas. Then the... Um, the mixed use zones, um, I think, generally speak for themselves. We're we're proposing getting rid of the downtown overlay district and replacing it with a downtown height overlay district, where the only difference within that area is your building height. And I wanted to show you a map here. Um, we're proposing this mimics our existing DOD, but it's going to be a DHOD three, four, and five, corresponding to three stories, four stories, or five stories. Right now, in all of our downtown overlay district, we allow three, uh, well, we allow a 27-foot building, which can be increased to 39, a 39, which can be in increased to 55. And so we really wanted to peg it down to actually correspond to a number of floors. In 55 addition to is really a four, isn't it? No, it's a five. So right now, you could do five. You could do five, yes. But that you're saying it's a four on your table. I don't think that's actually the intent. The um, you could do three on this side, and you can do five on this side. I think the numbering got screwed up on the side. I think this is actually well. I'm not sure. I we'll we'll continue to look at the map and make sure that it mimics what we have now. But essentially, we're going to have a downtown zone and a gateway zone that correspond to the existing DOD uses. And so you go to the use table for that zone, and but the, there's no height limit for that zone. You go to the height map just to view height. So it's a whole lot cleaner than our um, multi-page DOD section that has all of this stuff written out in text. We're simply relying on a map, a table, and then the uses are actually in the zoning table as their own thing rather than being an overlay where you have to read, go to another chapter to look at a list. Nick, do you also have charts that show this is the current and this is the new and 
side by side comparison. Yeah, that's in here. So okay. if you look at um, look arrows. <laughs> well, the the DoD is is interesting because people will suspect that we're giving more height when we say five floors when that's not changing. We're just clarifying, is my understanding. And we have we to make sure that we have yeah. um, we page wanna... six is where the DoD is. Okay. Page six. Is it a number change? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thank you. And actually, that's not correct because it's um, the existing downtown overlay district was um, up to 55 feet on the south side of Bay Street with a conditional use permit. Okay. It's so confusing now that. Oh, we, I, I, we know, I know, and we just want to make sure that they understand that we're. It's sure. It's a nomenclature more than a. Yeah. So that's what this table is intending to do. This is still in draft form. We just made this uh, at the end of last week, but we're trying to. We're trying to put the information in an easy to read format for people so that they don't have to yeah. read right. uh, All right. the whole code. R8 is R4 or something. Wrap this one up. Yeah, there's there's one other item I wanted you to look at, and that is the view, view protection overlay zone. So right now, this is our view protection overlay zone map that is from like 2009 or 2010. <coughs> um, right now, you can go and apply to the city council for an exemption. It, if it turns out that you don't actually have views on your property, and I think we've seen three or four of those in a <coughs> couple of years. Um, I've had Jim go through in GIS looking at topography, and um, so so actually looking at where things kind of flatten out and where um, there are actual slopes where it makes sense to measure things according to the, the methodology of using the uphill property line versus the average height of the property line. And so we've, um, I'll turn the the topo off. Basically, we've identified that the properties in red really are the ones that should be measured in this fashion. We think that the view protection overlay district, once you get further up uh, to the, I guess, east of Tracy, um, you're actually, you're really restricting the ability for anybody to build any kind of house because you're measuring from the uphill property line, but there's not enough vertical relief going kind of down the hill to actually get um, any any amount of height at all because it's so flat in those areas. And so we feel that this, the view protection overlay district should be kind of be reined in into these areas mm -hmm. and that the only thing that it should do are regulate the height of new structures built and if landscaping is required, the height of, or where you plant uh, mm -hmm. species that are going to grow above that height limit. And so if you have, if you do a commercial or multifamily development within the red areas, we would require you to provide the uh, expected height of any trees to be planted so that we can make sure that they're being planted in an area at an elevation where those aren't going to block somebody's views. But we're not going to get into the business of, uh, you know, what regulating. About, what, what, you know, like Mr. Sweeney, <clears throat> we've got that situation where it's of existing <clears throat> landscaping. So that's all grandfathered in, right? We don't we don't get involved in, uh, you know, what what things get spread through natural means. I mean, if if you know a swallow carries some seed and uh, drops yeah, it on the hillside I, I, and something but, grows. Let's say let's say something is planted mm -hmm. that's in 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 conflict with this, mm -hmm. or was before. We're not involved. We're not okay. I just yeah. We I mean we don't have the ability to keep track of that sort of thing. I mean it's. Um, so is that a civil matter that it was it a violation is. of our code then? The, the specific, it wouldn't be a violation of the code because unless the landscaping is required, which is only for multifamily and commercial mm -hmm. development, we don't review landscape plans. Okay, so is, is it a civil matter that... They need an easement. They need a view easement. easement. A view easement. easement. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They should either acquire a view easement or talk to their neighbor and say, hey, the tree that you planted is starting to block my view. Can we look into getting it replaced with something that doesn't grow so tall? Okay. And so it's, it's, you know. it's a neighbor a civil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so anyway, that's the view protection map is shrinking a little bit, but we've done it uh, pretty. You know, we've really looked at um, what what lots up here actually have the potential to have views obstructed, and um, I think if you if you go onto the if, once you take this map, if you were to go to the Kitsap County. GIS viewer and turn on the topo, you would actually be able to go look at some of these lots and think about what's the uphill elevation, you know, what building height is allowed, and is that actually going to block anybody? So, mm -hmm. that's where we're at. I expect to have the land use tables and the zoning regulations for each individual zone released publicly probably within the next two weeks.
weeks uh, in anticipation of introducing it to the Planning Commission in June, and then that hearing on that piece of it will be in July at the Planning Commission. Okay. How important is it to talk about the balance of the issues? I mean, are we... I was asked to bring one more last-minute thing um, by Public Works. Okay. Um, Thanks, I have This is, you can see in green on the first page, and there's an area map on the second page. This is in sorry, McCormick Meadows. Um, and this man, um, Mr. Reynolds, has a house on this lot that's only about a year and a half old, um, right backing up to the slope. And apparently after a year and a half, his retaining wall is collapsing. And so the engineer has said the entire thing has to be replaced. They can't really get to what they have to do just on that property, and the city owns the property 2012 behind it. Um, so he wants to request an easement from the city to come in from Lone Bear Lane, which crosses like the city property. Easement temporary and, construction easement. Yeah. And he's, he's just calling it an access easement to come in and repair, and maybe in the future to be able to maintain it if there's anything else that happens on that wall. But Zach asked me to just bring it to the committee and see if that's something that needs to, to go to council for the easement or how that should be handled. I, is Mark, what, where, where's Mark on this? Because normally we would give like a temporary construction easement. Okay. And then he would be able to... Act, yeah, so I, this is a stormwater pond that the city owns. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know... He said it would have to be fenced. We couldn't just allow unlimited access. We would have to keep people from actually going on to the remainder of the city's well, property. And I don't know if we want to do that in perpetuity. Okay. But I so temporary, temporary construction one, easement? Tem temporary construction easement wouldn't be a problem, and then they've got to restore... We just don't... You don't want to maintain a permanent road access yeah. road through there? I don't think so. Does, is that so that he just needs to go through Mark? Because for whatever reason, so. Zach referred it to the committee. So I, I don't... I think... Um, first day back, we don't so want I, to spend, okay. I don't think we would want to spend city resources on writing up the documentation. I think that they should write up the easement and... Yeah. Um, okay. And present I'll, us with something that they like Mark approve. Okay. Okay. I just need just some direction for him then. And I'll just tell him to coordinate with the mayor, if necessary, and Mark. Yeah. Okay. Mark can tell me the reason why we don't want to do it that way, but I'm going to rely on okay. the city engineer to tell me why. Okay. okay. These other two issues? These are... Uh, we can talk about them some other time, but... Uh, well, extreme retyping. Cool. That's we, also we pulled that agenda. Off the oh, you pulled that. Okay. DNR and Fish and Wildlife resolved their dispute. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> number three, I just wanted to plant the seed that I've been asked, what is... What is the city doing? And I'm not agreeing that it's the city's role, but there's the concern that with redevelopment of Bay Street, some merchants could be displaced. And I was asked, like, well, what sort of plan does the council have for finding a place for the people who are displaced? And I said, well, I'm not sure it's something that's our responsibility or we've thought we about. No, we have no role in that. But <clears throat> what kind of development are you talking about? The, the potential development okay. if, let's say, you know, the 800 block or what? Well, if things start redeveloping and rents go up, then, yeah, I might displace some of the current tenants. I suppose that could happen. But They're wondering if, they're, if we're requiring some sort of temporary uh, location for some of these people to go to. I don't think we could legally do that. Um, and there's no physical displacement that occurs as a result of a project on an adjacent property. No, but it, you see, in Seattle, they did something where they tried to mitigate on the waterfront, where they're doing the the Coleman Dock. They've actually given money to some of those other. Well, that's merchants. that's no, mitigation that's, uh, for okay. in, construction impacts. Right. Okay. Right. That's but okay. if we were but if we were working on Bay Street and doing something that people weren't going to be able to come in the front door of their mm -hmm. business, sometimes there is mitigation of that sort I think related to a project. Yeah. But I don't know that we have a role, but I just wanted to, well, to see that. Well, I think you can tell them to concerned. approach their landlord and see if you can or get other a long-term extension, have, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. a longer-term lease extension, so they couldn't be displaced. Well, or if their building is being rebuilt, they would have to move temporarily to another location. So that's, yeah, yeah. that's all private. Huh? Well, and, and I believe that the SEPA checklist has questions that talk about when redevelopment is occurring, will tenants be displaced? Okay, so that um, is... And so there, there is under SEPA, at least I think for residential, I'm not sure about commercial, the ability to uh, mitigate impacts of displacement. But, okay. yeah, nothing else, nothing is proposed for redevelopment where somebody is going to be displaced at this time anyway. Yeah, I just thought I, you know, something to think about. Um, 
With parking, uh, this is more of a wide, wider issue. Um, I know that um, there's a concern that when the county is redeveloping their, what, their courthouse, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are the, our parking requirements for the county? Um, in some ways, I, I met with the county, and that was okay. one of the first things I've seen in their presentation. And so part of their challenge is with their square footage requirements, they've got, so if this is division, this is Sydney, and this is Klein, and I'm an, obviously, obviously an architect, they have two different sites that they could potentially put their building on, okay? And they need a parking structure, and they need a new uh, court facility. If they, our current height restrictions are, would allow them to build a two-story building in this area. And that's probably not going to work for them if they want, if we want parking also, because they will use up their entire, they, they will use the whole footprint up in a two-story building. And, and so I've shared with Charlotte and she agrees, uh, and with, and her consultant that they need to build the parking first because they're going to end up building, they haven't decided yet, but most likely, uh, so they're going to build probably here, okay, and they're going to probably build some parking here, but they can't build on top of their, this, this building will take away their existing parking. So they have to solve parking first, and then they're going to need some more height than two stories, otherwise we will end up with a great big monolithic long building uh, they can do much more with articulation and building design if they're at three or four stories tall. So, they, and, and they're they're fully aware of that, and they fully my, intend my to comply. My concern is that I just want to make sure that we're asking or requiring we, adequate parking because I feel our like code, the administration, our the code requires building that they did not provide. It nor did we, that. and that was our that was on us. That's why yeah. I'm hoping yeah. as we move forward, we're asking them for more. We, we they will comply with okay. our code. And I, I think as far as height, we will try to build in some accommodation into our exist or into our zoning code update for the public facilities uh, chapter for for those building heights. So and I think we also talked about trying to tie the parking that is developed ultimately into something that the city could use during Correct. certain events and mm -hmm. occasions. Yes, that, that it would, there there's going to be parking that's secure mm -hmm. that's for. The judges and they don't. They, right now, the criminals are coming and going, and the families related to the court cases and the judges all come to the same area, and that's not how you want to right. do that. And the judges need to be able to come and go through a secure area. There's going to be there were, where there was exactly that discussion. There's, yeah, we're going to probably give them some concessions in height, and but we're going to get some public benefit from it too, and that we're going to have some. Parking to be able to be used for festivals and other things of that nature because those yeah. happen after hours. Right, and they have some own some other land uh, around that that they could yeah. also so the back church here. that's not that yeah. been used oh, yeah. in the last twenty years. Or yeah, so there's okay. those are the, really the two areas, and then eventually the other building goes away, and it's most likely a it's actually it's all of this gets blown up, and we end up with some sort of a public plaza and. and uh, a really neat facility, just depending on how much it costs and how much money, well, how you know how they can phase it. But parking, it has to start with parking. So, so you met with Charlotte, but have you met with the others? No, Charlotte and I and the consultant met, oh. but I've had a conversation with the other two. Okay, we had we had a meeting with Nick and Mark, myself, the design consultant, and and Commissioner Garrido. Okay. I think that's the only people who are in the room. Mm -hmm. It's been a couple months. Right. So they're now, you know, they, they just, they started their process and went, holy cow, we don't have enough land. Um, and it, this is really limiting us. So they came to the city to say, hey, here's our challenge. And, and uh, you know, I assured them that, you know, if parking's handled, there aren't any views we're blocking here. Right. There's no reason yeah, we, we no shouldn't. Direction list or no? That's not the map, but I'm thinking the other. Well, one. actually, yeah, they're, they're in the old one. The, they're in the old okay. one up here. But they'd but. only block the view from the jail, right? Well, yeah, and once you come down here, there are no views <laughs> at all. It's almost yeah. like this was. Yeah. And they can't see out anyway, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. So th th there's no reason we shouldn't <laughs> relax our code to allow some height and get a better yeah. product out of this. And they're 
they fully understand that there's a parking need, okay. and they and they're gonna. They probably it, it's gonna create growth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and, this is yeah. this is a, a milestone project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Yep. All right. So that's what I mean. Thanks. For that. Okay, we're right. adjourned at eleven twelve.